Di Eva Korja, it's Misha Robo Kofig. My name is Rob Coffey, Robo Kofig. It's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm a psychotherapist and co-founder of Inward Bound Psilocybin Retreats in the Netherlands. But today I'm speaking about something very close to my own heart. Uh, since my first psychedelic experience almost 30 years ago, the ancestral use of psilocybin in Ireland. Um, but actually, as this presentation evolved, it turned more into evidence of a shamanic tradition in the British Isles, of which uh, psilocybin has been a part. So I'm going to begin with some poems, or some quotes, one by W.B. Yeats, the great poet, Ancient Ar Ireland Knew It All. And in this presentation, I'm going to look at what Ancient Ireland did know. And a second by Robert Graves, again about Ireland. <clears throat> it frightens me. It's like going back into the womb. And it frightens me sometimes as well. So, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to try and cover a lot in this presentation, the prehistory, history, context, what Imbas Farasinai actually is. Uh, what a band fassa is, and then if I have time around the 19th century, Celtic revivalists. <clears throat> so I'll crack on because I've a lot to cover. Okay, prehistory, three and a half, five and a half thousand years ago, three and a half thousand years BC, the great sun temples of Brunabonia and Newgrange were built in County Mead. And that was a thousand years before Newgrange and 500 years before the Great Pyramid of Egypt. And the people who built them, we know not much about, but we do know they came from the Middle East. They came from Anatolia, far, and they were. Uh, they came via Spain and the Mediterranean, and they, what they did is they built these incredible temples. They knew a lot about nature and the cycles of nature. <clears throat> you can see the famous Triscal there in alignment with the, the, summer, or the winter solstice sunrise. And if you go to Newgrange, Brunabonia, the three, the three sacred sites you'll find, Nauth, Douth, and Newgrange, um, it's got some of the most advanced Neolithic art in Europe. <clears throat> Nauth. <clears throat> and this is something I found at doubt for the winter solstice. Uh, it's never opened this chamber, but they opened it up for the uh, sunset on the winter solstice. And it's this chamber, uh, you can see the actual engravings here, but what looks clearly like to me like a liberty cap, given that it's not a triangle, <clears throat> it's got the curves on the side and it's got what looks like a, a um, nipple on top. And liberty caps grow on these sacred sites to the day to this day. If you go to uh, if you go there in October, you'll find them growing. So it's a circumstantial evidence that this art was created, psychedelic art. Um, I would like to compare it to a sacred site in Peru called Huavan de Hunter. Has anyone been there? It's on the source of the Amazon, and it's known to be a tradition that was very much influenced by um, Huachuma. And the evidence for that is based on the Huachuma still grows there and the art that's in the area. So um, I feel like there's a lot of similarities here between the sacred sites of Peru and what we have in Ireland. Okay. But it's five and a half thousand years ago. It's a long time ago. We can't say for sure. But there seems to me there's clear evidence that there was some use of psilocybin. <clears throat> so moving on to history, I would like, look, like to look now at the unique historical position of England, Scotland, and Wales. So why is there a difference? Well, it comes down to the Romans. What do the Romans ever do for us? Well, in Ireland, it turns out not very, not very much at all. They, they actually, they traded a bit. They thought it was too cold and wet, which is fair enough, really. Um, <clears throat> so they didn't come to Ireland. They traded a bit, but they never, they never colonized Ireland, nor Scotland, North Scotland, for that matter. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because what happened in Anglesey, the two invasions, when the Druids fell in most of Britain, it was down to the invasion of Anglesey. And the Roman legions came across the Menai Straits and rafts, and they slaughtered the Druids and their armies, and they destroyed the oak groves. And this is an account from the Roman historian Tacitus. On the shore stood the opposing army with its dense array of armed warriors, while, in the, while between the ranks stashed women in black attire like the Furies, with hair disheveled, bra waving braids. All around the Druids, lifting their hands to heaven and pouring forth dreadful incantations, scared our soldiers by the unfamiliar sight, so that as if their limbs were paralyzed, they stood motionless and exposed to wounds. What, what, a, what a sight that must have been. And the story goes that that was kind of the beginning of the end of the Druids in Britain. Yeah? <clears throat> that, that didn't happen in Ireland. And in Ireland, uh, the old culture lasted at least until Patrick came in the 5th century, and much longer really, because what happened when Patrick came, 438 AD, 
they codified the Breton Law. And Breton Law was the old Iron Age law. It was one of the oldest legal systems in Europe. It goes back into ancient times. But it got codified in this document here called the Senkus Moor. And the Senkus Moor means the great ancient law. And I found this original copy in Ireland, a very rare, rare book from 1865. This is the first English translation. You see the old Gaelic, which is similar to Sanskrit, actually, as an Indo-European language. <clears throat> and this law was so sacred that it lasted all the way to the 17th century. And you couldn't change a single word of that law. It was, it was literally inscribed in stone, except it was an oral tradition. It was an oral tradition. And so the Senkus Moor was a combination of the old Brehen and the, what was acceptable to Christianity. So for that reason, the Druidic traditions lasted a lot longer in Ireland and in Scotland, for that matter. <clears throat> so the Philid, as they were called, or Philly, they were the seers or poets who held the Brehen Law. They were the keepers of the Brehen Law. And they were very highly respected. They trained for up to 12, 20 years, some of them. Comes from the Proto Celtic vigilus, meaning seer, the one who sees. <clears throat> and they kept the Brehen law alive until the fall of the Gaelic Old Order in the 17th century. Um, <clears throat> it, the, or, it was an oral tradition, none of it got written down. So the first document was the, the English version in the 1865. But they were very highly respected and they passed it down, they passed it down. Including my own ancestors who came from County Westmeath, where they were known as a hereditary Brehen family in the 17th century around Ishnock. Um, now, why does this matter? <clears throat> well, because they were regarded in the earliest times as combining the functions of magician, lawgiver, judge, counselor to the chief, and poet. Later but, later, but still at a very early time, the office seemed to be divided. The Brehens devoting themselves to the study of law and the giving of legal decisions, the Druids abrogating to themselves the supernatural functions with the addition, possibly, of some priestly offices and the Philly themselves being henceforth principally as poets and philosophers. This division seems to have already existed in Ireland at the time of St. Patrick, whose preaching brought him into constant opposition with the Druids, who were evidently at the time regarded as religious leaders of the nation. So this is, a, this is the actual text of the, the beautiful uh, the Senkus. It, believed, it was believed at the time it came from Egypt. <clears throat> and Thomas O'Rahilly, a great scholar, states that the object of the filly or seer was to commune with the other world <clears throat> in order that he might uh, tap the divine omniscience for his own ends. So they were clearly working in some form of shamanic tradition. <clears throat> this happened in Scotland too, of course, in Iona. You had the Druids, Dwyvnach Island, <clears throat> and the Caledae, the Culdees, who were the Christian Druids. And the result of all the inquiries which I have made into the history of the Culdees is that they were the last remnants of the Druids who had been converted to Christianity before the Christian church got any footing in Britain. There were Pythagorean Druids, or Druidical monks, probably Essenes, and this accounts for their easily embracing Christianity, for the Essenes were as nearly Christian as possible. There's also evidence in Wales, which I'll come to. <clears throat> so this is the end of the historical context. This ended in Ireland in 1607 with the flight of the Earls. That was the end of the Gaelic Old Order. And then what followed was a couple of centuries of pretty pretty intense colonial suppression around the language, um, the culture, and particularly around the, the Brehan law, because it was a threat to the, the new English common law. And um, you know, I don't like to dwell on the past, but that, that is what happened. So in a way, it was similar to what happened in, in Peru and Mexico, in that there was a fairly, there was a, there was a colonial suppression. OK, why does all this matter? Why is this relevant? Well, because of this ritual, that, uh, there is documentary evidence for it called Imbas Farasani, and it's an, a term from the ninth century, a book, and it, it means in old Gaelic visionary inspiration or manifestation that enlightens or that which illuminates. And I'm basing most of this on a work of scholarship by Nora Chadwick in 1935 in Scots Gaelic Studies by Oxford University Press. Um, Imbas Farasani was a ritual used by the Philid to invoke altered states of consciousness and achieve visionary inspiration or manifestation that enlightens. One of the oldest written records of Imbas Varasani comes from the Sanas Cormac or Cormac's Glossary in 908. It was written down by the Christian monks for the first time. And according to the monks, it was a process of revelation brought on by a divination sleep, mantic sleep, which acquired supernatural knowledge, a revelation of occult knowledge, or an ashling or a vision, again from Chadwick. Um, it involved some form of sensory deprivation, where we go into a trance for a couple of days, usually. Um, 
there would be ritual incantation and some form of substance was ingested. <clears throat> so it fits within Eliade's description of what shamanism is. It's a shamanic uh, ritual, a technique for attaining ecstasy that enable persons to come into the contact with the sacred order of the cosmos or using altered states of consciousness for healing or wisdom. So for me, clearly in Basvarasana was some form of shamanic ritual. <clears throat> the question is, did they use psilocybin? <laughs> well, one of the problems is the translations, because it was very ancient, it was old Irish, and first of all, it went through the filter of the Christian monks, who were very against the old ways, and then into English many centuries later. So the, the language is difficult, but um, <clears throat> it's described, the, the filly wants to see something, and then he chews the flesh of the red, the red flesh of a dog, and then says incantations and goes into some form of uh, trance, which can last up to a couple of days. Um, and then you come out with, or she'd come out with knowledge or information or healing. St. Patrick didn't like this practice and tried to ban it, yeah? <clears throat> so the question is, and many people, including myself, believe the, the red flesh of the dog could well have been a reference to the fly agaric and potentially psilocybin, which help people go into these clearly altered states of consciousness. Um, because there's no evidence at any other stage in Irish history of dogs being eaten, so um, it's m more than likely a translation issue, and this is what was some form of shamanic ritual using the fly agaric or a soma of, you know, and given that it was an Indo-European culture, it's not unlikely that this information came from the East. So that's Imbas Farasanai. <clears throat> it goes back way further, though. So in Irish mythology, it goes back all the way into the Iron Age, and Imbas Farasana is mentioned in the Kukulan cycle many, on many occasions as a shamanic ritual, as a way to go into trance. So this is a great uh, warrior, Fionnacool of the Fianna, and he uses Imbas Farasana. He was kind of a magician as well. It's many, many references in this saga. It's even older than that, though. It goes back all the way to the Iron Age, to Kukulan, our, our greatest warrior, the Ulster cycle, and the Tonbo Kulinya, which is dated back all the way to the first century AD. And... Uh, one, one writer called it a glimpse into the Iron Age. It's like an Iron, an Iron Age culture. And this is the old Gaelic. They mention Imbas Farasana again in that. <clears throat> but where does it come from? Where does Imbas Farasana come from? Well, in the Thorn of Bokulinia, it says very clearly um, that it comes from Scotland. Because in the Thorn of Cucullin went to Scotland and he learned Imbas Farasana from the Druid Escatach in Albu, which I think is a reference to Scotland. So it's evidence of a pan or a, an older shamanic tradition that was universal probably across the British Isles. <clears throat> and also in Wales it was mentioned, uh, this concept of awen, which is very similar to Imbas in Welsh, I believe. Geraldus Cambrenius mentions in his description of Wales a class of people who we call the awenition, who, who appear to practice an art closely resembling <clears throat> by Cormac, uh, and that described by Cormac as Imbas Farasanae. So this tradition goes back a very long way. It probably survived in other parts of the British Isles too, in the folklore and culture, but this is the evidence that we have, in written evidence <clears throat> from a thousand years ago and, and older. So I would like to compare something now. So this, <clears throat> okay. This is the oldest prayer in the British Isles. This is the old Amrigan's prayer or incantation when he came to Ireland and he took Ireland. The Milesians were the people who invaded Ireland. They came from Spain and they took Ireland from the two of the Danan, the mythical race of people, the people of the goddess Danu, who were believed to hold Ireland. And Robert Graves believed this poem went back to 1200 BC. So it's, it's probably the most ancient words that we have, certainly in Ireland and maybe even across the British Isles. I am the wind on the sea, I am the wave of the sea, I am the bull of seven battles, I am the eagle on the rock, I am a flash from the sun, I am the most beautiful of plants, I am a strong wild boar, I am a salmon in the water, I am a lake in the plain, I am the word of knowledge, I am the head of a spear in battle, I am the god that puts fire in the head, who spreads light in the gathering of the hills, who can tell the ages of the moon, who can tell the place where the sun rests. So I'd like to compare this now to another poem, does anyone, oh, this is the old Gaelic, I'm Gwaymer, I'm Tantrahan, I'm Fuamaram, I'm Dom Shetnarad, I'm Segnal, I'm Dair Grenya. Okay, very ancient. Does anyone recognize this? 
What is it? Yeah. So this is the prayer of Maria Sabina, the incantation. And when I saw this, it really, I was like, I am the woman who was just born. I'm the woman who looked inward. I'm the woman who looks under the water. I'm the moon woman. I'm the woman who flies. I'm the star woman. And it struck me as really incredible that these are thousands of years apart across a massive ocean. How could there be any similarity unless there was some shared commonality of consciousness that made them see the world a certain way? Um, and I suggest that commonality is, is psilocybin mushroom. <clears throat> um, yeah. So on to the women, because the women clearly were really important. And the women were kind of written out of history in Ireland. It was the monks, and they're all like warriors and kings. But um, the women were mostly illiterate, the peasant women, and they mostly spoke Gaelic. So they're not really in the history that much, you know. <clears throat> but we ha um, Chadwick, in her amazing book, scholarship in 1935, mentions that in the old, old books, or the Cucullan cycle, the Thorn, that Imbas Farasani was the, the subject of the women, right? <clears throat> they, were the, they were the experts on this. <clears throat> and in Ireland, we have a tradition of the Ban Fasa, or the wise woman, going back, or the Ban Kuvachtach, the woman with supernatural power, <clears throat> the most famous of whom is this one here. She's called Biddy Early. And Biddy Early to this day is a house, more or less a household name in Ireland. Everyone knows who Biddy Early is, though she died in 1872. And this is a book by Eddie Lenehan, a Shanaki, a storyteller. So it's, you know. And she was called by Yates the wisest of all wise women. And people would go from all around Ireland to see her. They'd travel and she'd be massive queues outside her house. And it's said that she had the cure for everything in the world. So she had the cures. And that meant she could cure. She was a master, master herbalist. And she had this blue bottle. She went everywhere with this blue bottle. <clears throat> and she went around and healed people. And what was in the blue bottle? Well, we don't know. We can never say for sure. But it's certainly a possibility that she knew <laughs> about the psilocybin mushrooms and that she used them in a healing context. Uh, because it's said of her that she knew all about the fairies. She was very connected to the fairies and the two of the Dan and the she. And even today in Ireland, if you say that's about someone that they're away with the fairies, it's kind of like derogatory. But I think most of my friends these days are away with the fairies. So. <clears throat> I'd like to raise the possibility that there was an indigenous tradition among the wise women of Britain and Ireland, should I say, and probably Britain too, of using psilocybin, and that was hidden or suppressed. But well, why would it have been hidden or suppressed? Because it was super dangerous to know this stuff, first of all. Um, the last woman for killed for witchcraft in Ireland was Bridget Cleary in 1895. Not that long ago, she got burnt, to, burnt by her own family for being possessed by a fairy. <clears throat> um, Biddy Early herself went to trial for witchcraft in 1865 under the Witchcraft Act of 1586 in Ennis Court. Luckily, it got thrown out. It must have been a terrible prosecutor because she was clearly a witch. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> she, um, <laughs> she got away with it. <laughs> and um, yeah, <clears throat> so there was a clear motivation to keep this stuff secret. Yeah, like could get you in serious trouble or even killed. Um, and there was three waves of suppression in Ireland. The first wave was around the fifth century when the first Christians came, but that more or less assimilated the old ways. The second wave was colonization in the 17th century, where there was three centuries, like you, you couldn't speak Irish, and certain, you know, it was, it was pretty brutal. Um, and then the, probably the worst of the lot was the Catholic fundamentalism that came in Ireland at the early 20th century, where it really became a, almost a totalitarian state. So, you know, it was very dangerous for the women to speak out. And they were, of course, most of them were illiterate and, you know, yeah. <clears throat> so, I would like to raise this possibility here as well. So this is WB8. So one of the great paradoxes of Irish history is that what we know of the old ways, a lot of it comes from the genius of the Anglo-Irish gentry, the aristocrats, who really went out and studied this stuff uh, in the 19th century. So you've Yeats, one of the greatest poets of the 20th century, Nobel Prize winner, you had Maud Gahn, Lady Gregory, <clears throat> and you had A.E. A. E. Russell, the main figures. And Yeats is an interesting character because he, uh, he was a poet, obviously, but he was also a magician. He was part of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn in London. <clears throat> he, was, he, was a, he was a mortal enemy of Aleister Crowley. Um, and he's from Sligo. Uh, and Sligo is a land full of, full of uh, folklore and old ways and sacred sites and also mushrooms. Um, so I would like to raise the possibility that these gentlemen knew about psilocybin and were using it. My hypothesis is, this is a painting by the great um, 
visionary artist and poet, A.E. Russell, and it's called The Stolen Child. And it's an image of a child being taken by the fairies, or the she, the two, the Dan. And, and he, he was a visionary, visionary like uh, Blake. He, he could see, you know, he was a seer. So um, he wrote this poem, and it's a poem about Bruna Bonia. It's, it's a poem, it's called A Dream of Angus Og from 1897. Angus Og being the two, the Dan and God of love. And his home was Bruna Bonia, it was Newgrange. And he says, this was my palace in, 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 in days past, many a one plucked the purple flower of magic and the fruit of the tree of life. I am Angus, men call me the, old, men call me the young. I'm the sunlight in the heart, I'm the moonlight in the mind. I'm the light at the end of every dream. The voice forever calling to come away. I'm the desire beyond joy or tears. Come with me, come with me, I will make you immortal. For my palace opens into the gardens of the sun and there are fire fountains that quench the heart's desires in rapture. So writing in 1897, what <clears throat> purple flower of magic was A.E. Russell referring to? I would like to raise the possibility that it wasn't a purple flower, it was a purple mushroom of magic which grows on Bruna Bonia. I know because I pick them there every year. <laughs> um, that access the tree of life. What purple flower or purple substance of magic <laughs> accesses the tree of life? I would like to suggest it was psilocybin. Why would they have kept this information secret if that was the case? Well, Yates and Russell and these guys, well, this is around the time Crowley was experimenting with um, <clears throat> peyote. And I'm just putting it out there that possibly they didn't know what this information getting to the hands of Crowley. And, um, but one, one, that's just a... Uh, hypothesis, but one of the interesting things about this poem, he wrote this poem in 1897, and it speaks of the uh, alignments, the winter solstice alignments with, uh, of Newgrange. And that wasn't discovered by archaeologists until 1960. So how did A.E. Russell know? Uh, unless he was tapping into something much greater. <clears throat> so, so then, is this a historical curiosity? And I would like to suggest that there is a living tradition in Ireland and probably other parts of Brit British Isles where it lasted, came down to us in our ancestral memory, our music, our folklore, our mythology. And we, that's our tradition. And it's time for us to reclaim our own ancestral traditions. Um, this is Henri Rohn, uh, one of my teachers, and he died a few years ago of cancer. He's a wisdom keeper from the west of Ireland, and he knew a lot of these things. And much of what I'm speaking about today is, comes from conversations I had with Henri. Um, and yeah, he held some of the cures, the old cures which were passed down. And even today in west of Ireland, in the place called Gort, there's the seventh son of a seventh son that you can go, and folk healers that still hold some of this old memory and old knowledge. Um, so I don't feel like it's a dead tradition. I feel like it evolved and changed, but it's still alive. Um, <clears throat> my hypothesis is that, well, that there's clear evidence of, uh, in our history and oldest written sources, or prehistory and oldest written sources, that there was an indigenous shamanic culture in Ireland. That's pretty clear. Um, I also suggest that that shamanic culture was not unique to Ireland, but was at one time present across the British Isles. But for historical reasons, it lasted um, much longer in Ireland and Scotland. Um, I also believe that uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms would have been a very important part of this tradition. Um, but, yeah. <clears throat> and I'm also arguing that it's a, li it's a living, living tradition, it's not a historical curiosity, that if we know that trauma gets handed down ancestrally, well, so does our strengths and our ancestral wisdom and memories, and they're not unique to Ireland, that we all have them, and it's time for people to reclaim our own history. <clears throat> um, yeah. So, and I rephrase the question of why would psilocybin containing mushrooms not have been part of a indigenous shamanic culture, given that these people were incredibly connected to nature, the cycles of nature, the lands, the memory of the lands. Um, yeah, it seems obvious. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so when, um, when uh, you know, the story goes that Gordon Watson went to Oaxaca and they discovered psilocybin mushrooms, I would like to say that they rediscovered, I'd say that was news to people like Biddy Early, 
uh, if she knew about it. <coughs> so sources, um, yeah, and yeah, that's me. <coughs> I think I. Uh, <laughs>